Welcome to our Stations of the Cross this evening on Ash Wednesday. And I know it will be a, a source of regret for many of you, probably the first time, maybe even in your lives, that you can remember that you've not been able to receive ashes on Ash Wednesday. It is a pity, but on the other hand, it's just a symbol, a symbol of what should happen in our hearts during this season of Lent where we turn our minds and our hearts towards repentance. And I thought it would be a good way to begin um, our Lenten journey by accompanying Jesus on his journey to the cross. Again, the fact that we can't meet in church is a pity because as you would have seen if you were down in the church for mass before lockdown began, We've got our newly restored stations round about the church that we found and have been beautifully restored for us. You can see them here behind me in the church and I hope maybe before Lent's out we might have the opportunity to gather properly. But this evening we'll still reflect on these, on these stations in our own parish church. So the first station, Jesus is condemned to death. We adore you, Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The high priest questioned him, saying, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said to him, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his robes and said, What need of witnesses have we now? You have heard this blasphemy. blasphemy. What is your finding? Their verdict was unanimous. He deserved to die. Some of them started spitting at his face, hitting him and saying, play the prophet now. Let's reflect on this first station just in the light of the particular difficulties that we face just now. The symptoms of coronavirus for many will feel like a condemnation breathlessness, pneumonia, the need for a ventilator for some are serious and life-threatening things. As Jesus is condemned to die, though innocent of any crime or charges, we too sometimes feel the injustice of the death of innocent loved ones, family members and friends. It feels harsh, brutal and inexplicable. We notice too the detail in the gospel that we heard, they spat in Jesus' face. This has become a weapon almost in this pandemic. We hear horror stories on the news of people spitting at the police or at NHS workers, perhaps as a sign of anger or frustration, but with the intention to spread the virus. Jesus knows exactly what it's like to be spat at, what it's like to be condemned to die. He walks with us. The second station, Jesus carries his cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Here is your king, said Pilate to the Jews, but they shouted, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king except Caesar. So at that, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. Jesus picks up his cross. It would have been a very weighty piece of wood, enough to support a man some feet from the ground. He has already been beaten, had a crown of thorns put on his head. What crosses are we having to bear these days? The cross of isolation, the cross of living with people that are hard to live with sometimes, the cross of a cramped flat with no garden, but what crosses are others carrying, those who are refugees or homeless, those who have elderly relatives they can't visit, those who are desperately anxious about money or about jobs? Consider for a moment the particular cross that you are carrying during these days. Most certainly you can talk to Christ about it in prayer. Jesus knows exactly what it is to carry your cross. The third station, Jesus falls for the first time. 
We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. For my part, I made no resistance, neither did I turn away. I offered my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who tore at my beard. I did not cover my face against insult and spitting. It's not surprising that Jesus falls over. The cross is heavy, is weakened by loss of blood, and the midday heat in Jerusalem is fierce. The ground is uneven and the crowds are pressing round. It will not be surprising either if we also fall over in these pressured days, a moment when perhaps we snap at someone we are sharing a house with, a moment when we lose our patience in a queue, a moment when we are reduced to tears by the sheer helplessness we feel in the face of illness and confinement. As we lie in the ground, literally and metaphorically, we can look to our side and see that Jesus is there with us on the floor, weighed down. Together with Jesus, we find extra strength to get up and to carry on. The fourth station, Jesus meets his mother Mary. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary of Magdala. Seeing his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then he said to the disciple, This is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. How much mothers suffer when they see their children suffer. It's hard to imagine the grief and distress of Mary as she sees what is happening to Jesus. And in hospital wards, which mothers cannot enter while their children struggle, how deeply the pain and sorrow that's felt. For children too, who can't visit parents or grandparents, there's great stress and distress. Jesus understands and Mary understands. And Jesus shows us his care for Mary as he trusts her to join the beloved disciple. He does not take away the fear and pain, but it does mean that she's not alone, as we are not alone. Jesus makes sure that we are never alone. The fifth station, Simon of Cyrene, helps Jesus to carry his cross. As they were leading him away, they seized on a man, Simon from Cyrene, who was coming in from the country and made him shoulder the cross and carry it behind Jesus. Simon is pulled from the crowd and enlisted to help Jesus. Consider the crosses that we are carrying and that others are carrying that we reflected on earlier. Then think about what it means to help another person to carry their cross. It could be as simple as a smile and a hello as you pass the window of a neighbour in isolation. It could be a thank you to the supermarket assistant that's regulating the queue. Carrying the crosses of people that are impatient or waiting. It could be leaving a thank you card it could be a donation to a food bank, a phone call to someone with no visitors, or a listening ear for someone who is in despair. To pick up the cross of another costs us time, energy, and, and sometimes money. And it transforms us somehow. Somehow our own crosses diminish when we shoulder the burden of another. Jesus shows us what that looks like. And Simon shows us how we can step in to help. For whom can you be Simon of Cyrene in this pandemic? Who needs help to carry their cross? The sixth <clears throat> station, Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. We adore you, Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and make you welcome, naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to see you? And the king will answer, I tell you in truth, 
insofar as you did this for one of the least of my sisters and brothers, you did it for me. What a moment of blessed relief in the heat, dust and pain of the journey to Calvary. This is a brief instant of soothing tenderness. Veronica comes from the crowd and wipes the face of Jesus and the image of his face remains on the cloth. In coronavirus wards, a nurse brings a sip of water to a patient with a dry throat. Another holds the hand of a dying woman, consoling her just by her presence. In a block of flats, a young child writes a letter to an elderly neighbour, reaching out through to them through their isolation. These are Veronica moments, moments of relief and kindness, tenderness and concern. And these moments make all the difference, allowing the fog of pain, loneliness and sorrow to lift and offering hope that even in cruel circumstances, love is present. The seventh station, Jesus falls for the second time. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Down in the dust I lie prostrate, too true to your word. Revive me. I tell you my ways and you answer me. Teach me your wishes. I am melting away for grief. True to your word. Raise me up. Again, Jesus falls. Lying in the road, tasting the dust, even as the soldiers shout and beat him to stand up to carry on. And again we fall. Consumed by grief for a person whose funeral we are not permitted to attend. Despairing as our children try to continue their lessons in a cramped house. Frustrated and angry as the death toll rises and we feel powerless. We fall and we too taste the dust the bitterness of despair, anguish and grief. And again, as we look to our side, we see that Jesus is there. And again, as we see him roughly hauled from the ground and pushed them on along the road, as he staggers forward, so too we have the strength to get up and carry on, for we know that Jesus understands. The eighth station, Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Large numbers of people followed him, and women too, who mourned and lamented for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, weep rather for yourselves and for your children. The tears of the women stream down their faces, they are bereft, consumed by the sadness of aching hearts, by the loss of someone dear to them. Jesus' response seems odd. Don't weep for me, but for yourself and for your children. By the time Luke's gospel was set down in writing, the listeners would know that the Jewish temple at the heart of Jerusalem had been destroyed. Jesus prophesies this and he shows us that even as he journeys to Calvary, his thoughts are not about himself, but about others. As we weep in these difficult days, can we also look beyond our own grief and suffering, our own broken hearts, and weep for those who are alone? Weep for those in countries with few hospitals and scarce supplies. Weep for those who have no more tears to cry. Weep knowing that even in his moments of greatest agony, Jesus is thinking about us, consoling us, and grieving with us. The ninth station, Jesus falls the third time. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Ill-treated and afflicted, he never opened his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughterhouse. Jesus falls for the third time, and in this moment, he must have wondered if he would ever be able to get up. Every part of his body is shattered, and even... With Simon carrying the cross, he can barely put one foot in front of another. We see the images of the nurses with faces marked by their masks. We see them slumped in corridors, defeated by the amount of suffering they are witnessing. We see the single mother living with three children in a cramped flat, worn down and trying to cope. 
As we look, perhaps we can make out the faint outline of a person sitting in the corridor with the nurse, on the carpet of the flat with the mother. They don't say anything, but just accompany them in their despair. That figure is Christ, fallen for the third time, with us in our moments of gravest despair, understanding exactly how we feel, never leaving us on our own. The tenth station, Jesus is stripped of his clothes. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. They took his clothing and divided it into four shares, one for each soldier. His undergarment was seamless, woven in one piece from neck to hem, so they said to one another, one another, instead of dividing it, let's throw dice to decide who is to have it. When Jesus dies on the cross, he is naked. It is the final humiliation. All dignity stripped away as his clothes are stripped away, becoming an object for soldiers to bet on with the throw of a dice. Christ comes into the world naked on a stable floor. He dies naked on a wooden cross. What sort of king is this? What kind of God? Jesus, fully God and fully human, enters our darkest moments and is present at the times when we are humiliated, when we are robbed of dignity. What do we find in moments that look bleak? We discover and rediscover how much it matters to love and to be loved. On the cross, Jesus may be bereft of clothes. He may be stripped and humiliated, but he is never robbed of the greatest garment of all, the essence of who he is, pure love. The 11th station, Jesus is nailed to the cross. We adore you, Christ, and we praise you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. When they reached the place called the skull, they crucified him and the two criminals, one in his right, the other in his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Jesus' final words are words of forgiveness. What would we want our final words to be to our loved ones and close friends? When we leave the house to go shopping or to go for our exercise, what are our last words? How do we end the phone call or the online chat? Take a moment to consider if there's someone who needs to hear some fresh final words from you, words of love, words of peace, words of forgiveness. The twelfth station, Jesus dies on the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. It was now about the sixth hour, and the sun's light failed, so that darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. The veil of the sanctuary was torn right down the middle. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And with these words, he breathed his last. The death of Jesus transforms the very fact of death forever. As we pray in the funeral mass, in death, life is changed, not ended. But for some days, months or even years, this truth of faith does not take away the raw anguish of grief at the loss of a close friend, a parent or a child. Our aching heart, our despairing cry, our sense of emptiness and loss. No words can often adequately express how we feel. So the open arms of the crucified Christ can be seen as God's embrace of all that is most raw and difficult as we grieve. And for as long as we need, we can simply allow ourselves to be held in that embrace, silently, with pure love. The 13th station, the body of Jesus is taken down from the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Joseph of Arimathea 
who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because he was afraid of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him remove the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission, so they came and took it away. Nicodemus came as well, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, following the Jewish burial custom. There are many who will never be able to cradle the body of their loved one in their arms in this bad time. And so this is a moment to pray for those who will do that for us. The nurses who will prepare the body, the undertakers who will wrap it in a shroud and season the coffin with oils and other preparations for burial or cremation. The priest who will be at the graveside or in the crematorium, praying with and for those who cannot be present. Through each of these people, Jesus is there. And with each of these people, Jesus cradles the body of our loved one. The 14th station, Jesus is laid in the tomb. At the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in this garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. Since it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Joseph of Arimathea then rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. There is a great silence on earth today, a great silence and stillness. The whole earth keeps silence because the king is asleep. These words are from an ancient homily for Holy Saturday. Jesus pierced, bloodied and cold body is in the tomb and there is silence. We wait, for this is not the end of the story. And just as the springtime buds blossom on the trees, so too the hope of resurrection stirs in the tomb, hewn from the stone. There is sorrow as we leave the graveside, but with the women and with the disciples, we will run to the tomb the next day and we will find it empty. This virus will pass. In the risen Lord, perfect love casts out fear, and neither death nor any created thing whatever will be able to come between us and the love of God made known to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Stations of the Cross mark Jesus' final journey from the moment when he is condemned to death to the moment when he is placed in the tomb. Jesus' journey to the cross has vivid echoes and resonances for us in this time. Jesus does not abandon us but walks with us. And along the way, he meets those who offer moments of soothing and generous relief. So let's ask the Lord to be with us, to comfort us, as we have accompanied him on his way to the cross. May he accompany us in the difficulties we face and in our efforts during Lent to draw closer to him. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Thank you for joining me this evening for these Stations of the Cross. And just a little reminder that tomorrow morning, of course, the 10 o'clock Mass has moved later in the day. So there's no Mass tomorrow morning, Mass tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock. So hope to see you back to join me tomorrow evening for Mass. Good night. Take care and God bless.